Welcome to the AI Investor Podcast from 24-7 Wall Street. On today's episode, we're sharing the details of an exciting new feature of this podcast, the launch of a portfolio of $500,000 of real money that we're going to be managing and discussing in full view of our listeners, allowing you to follow along with the exact high conviction trades that we're making in the AI space. All of that and a whole lot more is next. Welcome back, everyone. I am David Hansen, and I am joined by my co-host and 24-7 Wall Street colleague, Eric Bleeker. Eric, NVIDIA is about flat since we last spoke on the last episode. So I assume there's just no news in the AI space, everything just normal? No news whatsoever. You know, I anticipate we'll be talking for about an hour today. I think we could have spent several hours on the kinds of news there is because uh, it's been a busy two weeks. Exactly. So Eric, I don't want to bury the lead. I teased it in the open. We've got a really cool, um, really unique feature that we've decided to introduce to this show to make it even more actionable for our listeners and investors out there. We talked a lot about on our first episode that we don't want this just to be, you know, another podcast that's telling you about the news. We want this to be actionable. We want to give you investment ideas that you can uh, use in your own life. So you're taking $500,000 of your own money and launching a public facing portfolio where our listeners can follow with the trades, the position sizing. So let's just walk our listeners through the details of that, um, including some of the initial positions that we're going to be adding to the portfolio. Yeah, you know, like you said, we're trying to make this a podcast that is not just, it's about following uh, AI and the developments in the space, but it's about how you can practically make money and, you know, watch a trend that has the potential to generate so much wealth in the next decade and beyond and actually change your life for the better as well. So I thought about what's the most actionable way to do that. You know, it's not just talking about companies every single week. It's it's putting conviction behind where we're investing money, showing which stocks, you know, I can talk about, I like this stock on scale of one to 10 and eight or whatever. But at the end of the day, how you allocate money to it is, you know, how finance is done, Right. So if there's a way that we want to show people exactly how we're investing, exactly what stocks we believe in, I just thought that, you know, the, the best way to do that is to build an actual portfolio. It's worth noting, you know, $500,000, this is my personal money. Uh, this is my family's money. If it doesn't do well, it's painful for me. But that's what you want, right? You want people who have actual skin in the game. Because when people don't have skin and you're able to just throw out you know, a uh, prognostication on a stock that could double or something, right? That That's meaningless to those people. It only matters if they're actually investing. And it says a lot when you watch how people are investing, because again, that's the true basis of conviction across any other stock. So David, uh, you know, you can, you can tee them up, but we're going to start with some allocations today. And the idea is every single week we'll be reviewing stocks that we own and also continuing to add to the portfolio. This isn't something that's complete on day one. It's it's an evolving portfolio that will reflect, you know, how we're seeing the market. Yeah. So let's just talk about the first one. And I, you know, I can already, I can hear the eyes rolling or the, of <laughs> course, from our listeners, but NVIDIA is going to be a position in the portfolio. So we talked about NVIDIA a lot last week. This portfolio is going to have a lot of companies that are not NVIDIA. But just talk, why is NVIDIA, despite its enormously successful run as a stock over the last couple of years, why is it still getting a spot in our portfolio? Obviously, everyone knows about it, but that must mean that you still believe at this gigantic market cap, there's still upside for it. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the gigantic market cap is 2.9 trillion. That makes it one of the largest companies in the world. I think as of right now, it's the third largest company in the world. There's, there's so much talk about NVIDIA. If you turn on CNBC, you can set a timer. It's not going to last very long before someone mentions NVIDIA. And it's always this hyperbolic discussion. Often it's the next biggest bubble ever, or, you know, it's, it's the next company that's going to hit, uh, you know, $10 trillion or whatever. So I wanted to simplify this for everyone watching. The number that you need to base NVIDIA discussion off, I believe, is the next year's earnings in 2025. I believe they're about they're due to earn something like four dollars and fifty cents in earnings. So you per can share. take yep per share. So you can take where it's trading at, and you can divide by that number to get uh you know the multiple that's looking at. So as we record this, it's at about one hundred and twenty dollars per share, puts it a little north of twenty five times earnings. What we we're looking at recently was a lot of tech companies that 
uh, large tech companies, they were all trading in a band of around 30 to 35 times forward earnings. Historically, that's a little high, but these companies also historically have performed extremely well. So you need to account for that as well. We saw these valuations come down across the board with probably the strongest being NVIDIA. I said on our show last week, David, I said, I hope NVIDIA falls 10% after earnings because I'll load up into it. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I added some in my personal portfolio. I won't be able to add to the portfolio I'm building for this show at the lowest levels it hit, which was just over $100 per share. But you can see if it's down by $100 per share, you're looking at closer to you know, 20, a low 21, 22 times earnings, which brings it back very close to market multiple. So what am I excited about? NVIDIA, I'm excited about, you know, where we are in this cycle right now, which we're going to discuss today, because we're going to talk about, you know, three trends that could really define 2025. The expectation has been that NVIDIA is going to be driving towards peak earnings in this next year, and that after that, there's going to be a lot of concerns about falling spend. Well, I'm looking at a lot of the trends and excitement in the space, and I think this peak earnings discussion is going to actually shift. So we're going to go through a Blackwell cycle with really strong growth rates. That's going to allow NVIDIA to perform pretty well across the next year. Now, we're going to be pretty strategic on how we invest in NVIDIA. This isn't just buy it once, set, and forget. We're probably going to change our allocation around, you know, depending on what we're seeing. But I'm starting by investing $25,000 in NVIDIA as kind of a core holding. That's 5% total portfolio. And that leaves some space where we could take that up, you know, especially if it comes back down to $100 or we can stand pat. And in addition, I think we're going to continue to watch for each of these stocks. I'll talk about a few more we may be adding. I think we're going to be looking at some other uh, peers to NVIDIA, Broadcom, Marvell, AMD, all potential uh, additions to the portfolio as well. Now, we don't ever want to say, you know, this is the floor, but you mentioned kind of the $100 price point. And when we talk about earnings over the next year, you said on the last show, you know, it's pretty much in the bag that Blackwell is going to be a big success. There's enormous demand for it. It's still supply constrained, even though they said we're going to get supply online. But it seems like the earnings story is pretty much, you know, not set in stone, but we kind of know what earnings are going to be over the next 12, 18 months view there. So looking at that multiple there, do you kind of see that 20 times earnings, a hundred dollar price point? Is that, do you see that as the floor? Obviously, you know, we never know what's going to happen in the market, yes, yes. but is that kind of the point where you start to say, okay, it's at hundred. If it drops to 80, it becomes a screaming buy. Is that kind of the, the price that you really think are, are, you're watching in terms of going more into this name? Yeah, right now I'm kind of watching a band, uh, you know, floor around 20 X and upper bound around 35 X and, kind of basing conviction in how we want to size it upon there. And like I said, right now, it's a little bit closer to the lower bound at, you know, about 25, 26 times earnings, depending on where it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe it, it would be hard to see it following, falling more dramatically than that. The, the situation which would likely cause it would be if there was rumblings that some of its biggest customers, these hyperscalers like a Microsoft, were exploring taking their capital expenditures down. That's a point where you could probably see it breaking below the lower bounds that we've set because it would bring into kind of the narrative the idea that they are hitting peak earnings, which is the fear right now. Right. Okay. We're going to talk about NVIDIA, I'm sure, on future shows. We talked about it last show. It's going to probably be in every show. Uh, so let's move on. Let's go through the other names that you want to be yep. adding to the portfolio as we launch it here. Yeah, so let's do stock number two, which is Synopsis. This is another stock that we talked about last week. It's ticker is SNPS. It's worth about $70 billion, which for perspective, that's going to be somewhere around the 250th largest stock. Uh, so not tiny, but also not a household name. Just to reiterate what we talked about last week, again, you can go and download that podcast, listen to it, but I love the competitive positioning of this company. It has a Coke and Pepsi situation with its closest competitor, which is Cadence. I love its growth opportunities. I believe AI is extremely additive to its revenue rather than a threat. And I love its end market. There's a lot more companies getting into chip design. 15 years ago, 100% of its revenue was to semiconductor companies. Today, that figure is less than half. And it's because eight of the 10 largest companies in the world are now designing their own chips. 
and it is expanding the customer base that Synopsys works with. We said, the only thing I don't love about this company, it's just its valuation is priced. That's a great company, which it is. It's fallen a little bit since then. So we're going to take this opportunity to do a $10,000 investment, which is roughly 2% of the portfolio. This leaves opportunities for me to continue investing in it. If I see more opportunities as it falls, I can also diversify by buying that, you know, Pepsi and Coke situation with Cadence, which is the other big name in the space. Overall, I think we're going to look for software plays, which this is a software play, you know, that could be, uh, you know, a company like Palantir or names in the business intelligence space. It could be cybersecurity. Um, we're going to look at the hyperscalers as well. Companies like Meta that have dominant model positions. So I think if you're looking at this portfolio and saying, is it going to be all semiconductors? No, we're looking across a lot of different areas. Software investments is going to be a space we're going to try allocating towards. And one thing we should say about, you know, investing $500,000 in this portfolio, I'm going to most I'm going to assume that most of our listeners understand you don't necessarily need to have $500,000, you know, if you have are setting aside some money that you want to invest in this trend, it doesn't have to be these exact dollar amounts, of course. But just to give listeners a sense of, you know, you said 20,000 on Nvidia, this one's a smaller position at 10. Is that kind of a ratio that you feel okay about these companies in terms of someone and we're not trying to give exact advice here on the earnings portfolio, but is that something people can take away as kind of, a, okay, 20,000 versus 10 on synopsis? Is that a fair kind of ratio that someone can think about? Yeah, NVIDIA was 25,000. So 25, yeah. 5%. Yeah, I think just being able to think about sizing that way. Let's say you've got $10,000 in cash today. Um, you know, maybe you might think about, you don't need to do the exact ratios, but oh, I'm going to start with a couple thousand NVIDIA, maybe a thousand in synopsis roughly following, and you're able to start building out, you know, this portfolio of companies that our goal is to give you exposure to the best companies and also the best trends. So if you're able to buy some smaller pieces in approximate sizing, you're going to be able to recreate what we're doing, even if you're not investing $500,000 or following this exactly. Right. Okay. So we talked about NVIDIA and it's nearly $3 trillion dollar market cap. We just gave a 70 billion. Let's move on to our next one, which is more in the middle of those two numbers. And that's uh, Taiwan Semi. Again, at a company that people have heard about, but talk about why you think it belongs in this initial portfolio buy. Yeah. I mean, it's worth 750 billion. It's it's a larger company. It's it's only trading for about 17 times next year's earnings, which, you know, that's kind of an interesting situation because this is a company with a near monopoly in manufacturing cutting edge chips. Uh, it's it's going to grow profits by more than 30% and it's trading for market rates. Well, why is that? Well, the unfortunate side to Taiwan Semiconductor might trade for double its valuation if it wasn't located in Taiwan and it didn't have the geopolitical cycle. So that's that's always going to be something that hangs over it. But I love the catalyst for this company across the next year. There's a super cycle happening where Apple's going to see a much higher upgrade rates on its phones. Right now, their upgrade rates are at its lowest point ever. There's a really large install base that needs to upgrade, and AI features give a reason to do that. Its competition is fading. Intel, there's probably going to be a government bailout for Intel, would be my guess, but it's going to take years to turn that chip around. Samsung is really struggling right now. They're falling behind Taiwan Semiconductor. The company is uh, effectively pushing... Uh, pricing uh, changes onto its customers. The customers have said, hey, we realize your value. We're going to have to pay. Like that's a good situation to have. And they're increasingly driving the services that are valuable to customers and things like packaging chips that, again, it, it adds to the value add and their ability to raise pricing. So I just really like the position that they're in. I'm going to initially invest 15,000, which is between Synopsys and NVIDIA. And I think too, where we'll look, I'm not starting with any of the semiconductor like equipment plays that would actually be kind of the suppliers to Taiwan Semiconductor. Companies like ASML, Tokyo Electron, BA Semi, KLA 10 Core, the companies we discussed last week. I'm probably going to add those in a future edition. With those kind of companies, I'm just very closely paying attention to valuation. And that's especially if we get 
let's say if recession fears really pop up across the next week or two and we get a 10% discount on those, that's where we can be strategic and I can issue trade alerts and immediately take advantage of pricing situations. And David, after we've got one more stock, but we'll talk about how to follow kind of this portfolio in real time as well. Sure. And just, you know, one more thing on Taiwan Semi, you mentioned the, I think kind of the, it's been covered as so much in the media over the last couple of years, the kind of the obvious risk of just where it's located in the world. Is the valuation, is that enough to make people feel okay about this? Because obviously the fear on the extreme side is just, hey, something happens in Taiwan and are, is this company severely impaired from being able to do business? So you feel okay enough about it's trading at a cheap enough valuation that it's kind of the market has taken into account those risks. And right now we're just kind of, we're investing on the business upside of it. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I am not blase at all about the risk that China presents to Taiwan. I know this is a geopolitics show, but you're not you know, an expert in geopolitics. <laughs> <laughs> we're probably going to have to do some shows discussing it because chips at this point are geopolitics. Sure. Um, you, you can't extricate the two. So I, I feel like one of the advantages of this setup where it's a dynamic portfolio that we can reinvest at any given time, if, if I am finding the situation around geopolitics to be too risky, we can, we can reallocate. But we're going to have to consider this to some degree. You know that as, as situations change, what's going on in the world might define how we're positioning the portfolio, which is pretty unique. You've never had to think much about this if you're investing in companies like Microsoft or Amazon, but it is just a feature of the next decade. Um, and at 17 times earnings, I, I feel pretty good about the risk reward that we're getting for Taiwan Semi. Yeah, I think if you can wade through some of the muck in the the de presidential debate from earlier this week, I think I think uh, I think Ta Taiwan Semi maybe wasn't mentioned by name, but yeah, chips did come up. Um, so to your it was point, definitely mentioned. Yes. Center. Yeah. So let's let's move on to our final buy that we're going to be sharing in this initial introduction to the portfolio. And it's another company that we talked about last week, and that's Coherent. This is the smallest company that we're going to be adding. So again, listeners who did not listen last week, go back. You can get a deeper dive on Coherent. But let's just talk a little bit more about why now? Why are we adding it to the portfolio? Yeah, as you mentioned, it's the smallest of the group at 11.5 billion. That is sub S&P 500 level. I know it's Kind of wild to say a $11.5 billion company is small. It is in today's market. It's a diversified company. About half of its revenues are going towards communications, which I see as a big play within you know the future of data centers. So the idea is that interconnects that are connecting all of these GPUs together across these massive clusters are going to see a massive wave of growth. We're going to talk about that in our trends for next year. My belief is when investors go looking for investing ideas, they're going to wind up on Coherent as a top play. Now, it's it's not the only company in this space. You can look at Credo, uh, Lumenta, Marvell, Broadcom, all have connections to kind of this networking opportunity. It's it's a very long list. I think we're going to over allocate towards this idea. I think by the end, we could have 25% of the capital for the portfolio just going for this one opportunity. But I'm kind of introducing Coherent today because I, I think it's it's a pretty stable company. I love the leadership in the company. Uh, I, I think the CEO has a great strategy that could lead to impressive returns across the next five years. So I'm going to do $10,000 or about 2% of the portfolio. That's the same number I did for Synopsis. But again, I think this number is going to go up and it may go up with further investments to Coherent. Uh, it's certainly going to go up with other companies in the space, but it gives investors exposure to a trend that I would, I would just estimate, you know, most people watching this actually don't have exposure to this. And it's not going to be something that you watch CNBC and they're like, let's talk about interconnects in the data center today, right? You're, you're going to get exposure for this listening to a podcast like this, and you're not going to just get exposure to it. You're going to get a complete strategy. Great. So you alluded to it. We're talking about these buys here. This is obviously a place you can go maybe to first hear in detail the trades that we're making, the position sizing, but let's talk a little bit. Where else can people go? Because if someone's listening to this and I hope no one's driving to work and they're trying to write down these names and these ticker symbols might be a little confusing. So let's talk about the other ways that we're going to be sharing the details of this portfolio. 
Yeah, so we're going to have a few different paths that you can follow because, again, we will announce every trade before we make every trade. Now, this show, it's it's brand new. No one's moving the market with these trades, but I also do want to give people confidence that no, there's no front running. We will only trade after we notify the listeners themselves. So for every single trade, I will make an announcement. I'll do it from my personal uh, X or Twitter account, which is Bleaker Tech. If you search my name, Eric Bleaker in Google, it should come up near the top result. If you follow me, I'll announce it there. If you follow 24-7 Wall Street's account, we will also announce it there. And we will have a page on 247wallstreet.com where we will be tracking these alerts. I will announce them. I will put a buy thesis. And we will put a trade confirmation after we've concluded the trade. From that page on 24-7, we'll also have a document where we're tracking the buying prices and performance performance of these stocks over time. So again, there's there's ways to track in real time. And also in every next podcast, we will review trades that we've made and also, you know, just talk about any events following these stocks. So if you want to get trade alerts in real time, follow 24-7. You can follow my account. And if you want to just be continually appraised of the portfolio, we're going to continually track it on the podcast itself. Great. And again, we do have the email address that we set up last week, questions at 247wallstreet.com. If there's questions about the portfolio or anything like that, shoot, or shoot questions our way. We're, we're going to be happy to answer them. And again, if you have if you have friends or, or colleagues that are looking for stock ideas, maybe you're the friend that people are always badgering, hey, do you have any good stock ideas? Uh, what are you buying these? So if you don't want to have to, have to answer that, share this podcast, uh, share the links that Eric talked about, and uh, we'd love for them to to hop on board and follow the journey. So again, exciting portfolio that we're going to be doing here. I want to move on, Eric, to some news um, in the AI space. A couple of big companies, uh, a couple of big quotes um, that are grabbing some attention. Obviously, was being sarcastic at the top that nothing has happened in the world of AI over the past two weeks. Uh, we had Oracle report earnings. Stock was up, I think, 12% on earnings. Again, this is like a multi- hundred billions of dollar company that's moving 12%. So we're just continuing to see these massive moves in huge tech companies because there's so much kind of unknown happening, huge earnings beats, revenue growth. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about some pretty wild quotes that we heard from Larry Ellison, who of course is the, the founder of Oracle. He was on the, the conference call. So one of the quotes that jumped out to me was um, he was talking about, you know, building these, these frontier models and what it takes to build them. And the number you threw out was you're basically going to need about a hundred billion dollars to build one of these models when that's just a lot of you can buy a lot of sports franchises for a hundred billion dollars <laughs> and that's what to build frontier models so there's there's just enormous dollars being thrown away i, I want to not thrown away thrown out i want i wanted to ask you what else stood out from ellison's comments and, and kind of just what your takeaway that you got from him who's obviously you know he's been in the tech world for so long he's a respected voice in this space yeah you know it's interesting that you have this prior generation of tech companies that dominated things like dot com you could talk about ones that fell behind like cisco in many ways or uh yahoo which you know is is a fraction of its former self and even intel kind of fading away and then you have other companies that have managed to reinvent themselves we were kind of laughing because we were preparing for the show and you were like oracle have they really done well i mean only up 200% the past five years. A laggard. Yeah. <laughs> Which shows generally how well technology is done. But yeah, Oracle is kind of getting a little bit more into the Microsoft camp of reinventing itself around cloud computing and, and AI technologies. And they were up 12% after these earnings. So what struck me from these quotes, Larry Ellison, he, I mean, he was just, jumping out of his skin. He was so excited talking about things. You look at that quote talking about a hundred billion dollars to be able to build frontier models. That that was extremely interesting. Also, he followed up with the fact that they're they're in the permitting process for nuclear reactors to be able to power some of these new data centers that they come out with. But what's interesting is right after they did the earnings and he had that we're we're actually perming nuclear reactors quote they then came out with a press release about what might be the most powerful data center in the world. It is, I'm 
I've got the numbers right here. I'm looking at it's a system with 131,000 Blackwell GPUs. I ran the numbers on this. I believe that this one cluster of chips could potentially bring in $5.5 billion in revenue to NVIDIA itself. So it shows the scale of the ambition that's happening. One more thing, David, that I thought was really interesting from this. Larry Ellison, he got the quote or he got the question that you often see from analysts about how much longer is the spending going to go? Because, you know, we're not seeing all the breakthrough products in AI that you'd expect. And he gave a really interesting answer that he basically said, look, I'm I'm on the board of several healthcare companies. I'm working in, in this space with several startups. Pretty soon, everything, x-rays, being able to do ultrasounds, that's all going to be tied into AI. So I'm, I'll read it. When are we going to start monetizing it? Well, all of Cerner is the monetization. The fact that we can dramatically expand our health business is because it's based on AI. It is AI is just, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, the best way to describe it, it's not something you sell separately. It is the diagnos diagnostic system. It is the electronic health record system. It is the pharmacy system, the prescription system, the user authentication, the login system. Everything is AI. And I know people think it's a separate thing. Oh my God, I hear a bunch of applications come and say, oh, now we've got AI agents we will charge separately. I mean, it's our applications are going to be primarily AI applications, everything. How'd you charge separately? So David, we're going to talk later about agents as one of the big trends for next year. But I think he really captured that in so many of these industries, software and what it fundamentally is, is going to transform into AI. And that's what he is seeing at the forefront. So again, you know, you, you have these tech leaders who are positioning these companies well, and you're, you're wondering what they're seeing. I thought that was a great quote that encapsulated, you know, what a Larry Ellison is seeing that he is basing the entire future of his company on AI at this point. Yeah. I mean, you talk about Larry Ellison, he's not exactly a spring chicken anymore. I think he's 80 years old and he's talking about, I think part of his quote was, this is going to be a battle for tech supremacy over the next five to 10 years. And he's jumping out of his seat. So he's going to be 90 years old in 10 years. And he's excited about this. You just start going down the list of these well-known people who are excited and just almost just can't contain themselves about what are the possibilities here? You have Nadella at Microsoft, Google has come out and said the same thing. Elon Musk, I think I saw that what, what uh, Sergey Brin was saying, he's back in Google every single day now working on AI because he can't believe how fast it's moving. So we talked last week about could AI turn into the next dot-com bubble and the hype just gets so big and there's not a payoff there. It's always on the table, but you do start to look at the list of people who have kind of staked their reputation on this working out and having a return and being something that really does deliver value. And it starts to become pretty, uh, you know, hard to disagree with what these people are saying. And maybe if they're wrong, there's gonna be a lot of reputations that are tarnished a little bit, but the list just keeps growing of people who are seeing this firsthand and working on the front lines and the enthusiasm doesn't seem to be slowing down. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think um, when we're looking at other news, some of the recent rebound in the price of AI stocks is really reflective of what you were just talking about, that the past two weeks has really seen a cavalcade of some of the biggest experts coming out and kind of issuing bullishness that we haven't seen recently. There's there's a fundamental shift in the air right now. Yeah, and we mentioned last week, you talked about Blackwell. What were the numbers you threw out? Six times more powerful than we haven't even had. Yeah. You know. yep. <laughs> so we haven't even had those, you know, the next generation is not even fully rolled out. So again, we don't want to get too, we don't want the hype to get too ahead of ourselves. I wanted to hit on one more, um, a couple more news pieces. We we saw the announcement that Palantir, kind of the mysterious software company that everyone's like, what, are, what exactly do they do? You've been on record saying this is, um, you know, an AI play for about a year now. I think you said, hey, this could be the next NVIDIA type stock here. It was announced that it's joining the S&P 500, which of course to be included in that, you have to have, a history of profitability you have to be a certain size so a pretty big moment for palantir and i think the stock was up some 15 percent on the inclusion news so any thoughts on on the palantir news there yeah palantir it's it's definitely high risk high reward i've personally i own the stock i also own options on it because i i've thought that's a better way to capture the upside and potential in this company it's it's now worth 78 billion um it's going to do less than 3 billion sales this year so for perspective it's, it's price to sales 
ratio is about the same as NVIDIA's PE ratio currently. Bank of America, they just raised a price target to $50. Um, I think that's kind of chasing the share price. But like you said, this is a stock that we've been covering for a long time. We actually predicted its inclusion into the S&P 500 back in you know July, I think we wrote about. If you Google discover the next NVIDIA, you can get our full 38-page AI report that we've issued on 24-7 Wall Street. You can get the whole thesis there. But I really... You know, I, I like this company's potential to to really be the go-to place that companies start with AI. They they have major announcement this week with BP that they're gonna be uh, you know, a really tight partnership with that company. And, you know, again, it's just I'm trying to think how much we would think about investing in Palantir in the portfolio. And, you know, we're going to be strategic around pricing. It's going to have to be in the portfolio eventually because the upside's there. Um, you know, it is just right now it is also at a very premium multiple. So it's a stock that I'm always watching. And, you know, when we look at stocks that are going to be included in the S&P 500, it's worth mentioning that has become a major near-term catalyst. I think super micro Jump like 18% when it was included. It's also lost all that and then some at the current time. But if if anyone out there is, you know, looking at stocks that could be included uh, and, you know, that is a potential catalyst, I think one stock that is at the top of the list to be an inclusion the next time they rebalance would be Workday. Uh, I was surprised that they didn't make in this round. So that that is becoming a facet of today's investing world that there is so much passive money that when stocks get in these major indexes, it is becoming a catalyst for investments. Right. Any? Uh, did I miss any other news that jumped out to you from the last last couple of weeks? I mean, I'm sure there's endless things. Again, you said we could probably talk for over an hour here, but anything else that you think is worth just highlighting from the past couple of weeks and on the news side of things? Yeah, I think it it was interesting because coming into a couple of days ago, we're filming this on Thursday, September 12th. Uh, into Wednesday, a lot of these stocks were down dramatically. There is a major AI conference happening at Goldman Sachs right now. And from the moment NVIDIA started speaking to this moment that we're talking about, which is only about 24 hours later, it's up 10%, which for perspective is 3.5 times the size of Intel. <laughs> when you look at Right. That's crazy. Right. I'm picking on Intel. I think there's been a lot of I know it's been a dog, but you're really picking on Intel today. I think they deserve to be picked on a bit. But, you know, we just we look at what's going on and you you really highlight this earlier. You have quotes in recent days from Sergey Brin saying, you know, he is back in the office. Elon Musk saying this is the most powerful technology. Another really interesting thing. Uh, event at that AI conference was Microsoft CTO came on stage and they were asking him, is, is AI stagnating? And he basically said, if I was talking to you in private, I could convince you it's not. Um, but we're seeing things behind the scenes. I just can't talk about right now, but mm -hmm. if you saw them, you would know that's not the case. So again, there is, there is this almost wedge that's growing right now where in the media you're seeing more and more talk about ai being a bubble and what's going on and the people who are at the forefront are getting ready for some really big developments happening and you know why you can really tell this is the case open ai is talking publicly about raising a valuation of 150 billion which is close to a double from where they raised before you know, if they're talking about that means because the people who are investing have seen that something big is happening. And I think this is all really setting up 2025 to be a re-acceleration around excitement in the AI space. But again, we're going to talk about trends so we can talk about a little bit more details on that in a minute. Yeah, let's let's actually jump into, into the trends that we're looking at. You know, the biggest trends going into, hard to say that 2024 is nearing the end we've only got a couple more months so as we go into this next year you said the re-acceleration you know maybe it's plateaued a little bit in terms of excitement i think many would say that 2024 has been the year of ai you're saying next year could be even bigger so let's talk through some of these trends which ones are kind of new which ones are continuations or just something that's already in the marketplace now getting bigger so where do you want to start on the trend side of things Let's start with the launch of Blackwell, because uh, I think this is kind of the fundamental jumping off point for a lot of the advancements in AI. 
I think AI has a little bit of a, you would almost call it like a TikTok model where the amount of compute, the kind of processing performance makes a jump, which then allows a jump in the software, the, the AI models, which feeds the next compute cycle. Mm -hmm. So we're at a point right now where we're actually kind of hitting a wall on the compute side where the biggest data clusters, they can only get to about 100,000 GPUs. And the reason for that, which again, this will kind of dovetail with other concepts we're going to talk about, is that it's not just the processors, it's about the entire stack of technology in a data center, about how you network them all together, the switches, the optics. And if everything's not getting better, you're not going to be able to make these data centers meaningfully more powerful. Blackwell is meaningfully more powerful. You know, you talked about you can benchmark things all kinds of ways. We talked about 6X last week. I was looking at the first real benchmarks I've seen came out for it on August 28th. And if you're just looking at a tokens per second running, uh, this is Meta's model. The B200 was at 11,264. The prior uh, most advanced chip, the H100 was at 3,065. So that's a performance jump of about 3.7 fold for pricing that is not 3.7 fold. You know, it might be more like 50%. So again, this is going to give a massive performance jump. And it's also going to make all of the other technologies um, that are necessary for making these huge GPU clusters. It's going to move them all forward meaningfully, which is another trend we're going to talk about in a moment. But again, this is going to unleash that next generation of models. So when something comes out, last week we talked about the chat GPT moment and GPT-4 being this massive leap forward in how you know, you're able to almost see AI reason. The next generation of models are going to be another kind of leap forward that begins a new hype cycle, a new, and Blackwell coming out is going to facilitate this kind of up leveling in capabilities so that that impacts nvidia and that's what almost all media is going to focus on but it actually has cascading effects across the entire ai space so you talk about the the gpt moment where we can kind of see ai logic and you know put things together not to put you on the spot and it might be that we don't know all the capabilities of blackwell what are the kind of big unknowns or things that Blackwell might be able to unlock that we haven't been able to achieve from just a functionality perspective? Is it kind of the ability to have better memory of what's going on? Or is it just we don't know yet and we won't know until we start building the models with the new new chips? Well, let's let's use that as an opportunity to go to a second kind of prediction for the biggest jumps. I think we have to talk about AI agents. And so far, AI agents has been pretty almost theoretical. Um, basically, an AI agent is an AI model and algorithm that can autonomously make decisions. You're seeing a lot in things like coding, but it's not going very mainstream. So we had Brett Taylor, or he was on a podcast name, Invest Like the Best recently. Mm -hmm. And he's building out an AI agent company and where they're starting as customer service. And he had a quote that basically the interface and how you interact with every single company will increasingly be driven by agents that are, you know, they're going to autonomously be able to make decisions. You know, you could actually be talking on the other end to an AI, you know, agent that it's not just trying to query from a select number of questions. It's actually able to make decisions for a company itself. Yep. And it reminded me a lot, you know, when we worked on Molly Fool, David Gardner, who's one of the founders of the company, he had this quote that, you know, in the early 2000s, he said, eventually every company will be an internet company. And at the time, the internet was so nascent, but he had seen kind of around the bend and he had seen that not only will every single company have a website, but how you do your CRM will be based on, you know, the internet. And now with so many remote companies, right? The internet is the basis for how companies collaborate together. So that was a true, truly prescient and true quote. And I think we might be looking at something similar for agents. You could see how you interact with the company, go to its website. It's just an agent like, what do I need to do today, right? You could begin interacting with Amazon around how you want to be shopping for anything. Apple intelligence, 
you can see how almost all consumer hardware is going to be remade because you think about something like Siri. Why does Siri stink? Like everyone hates Siri, right? And it's not just because it can't understand what you're saying. It's also because the missing thing with voice has always been you need to be the UI and you need to know how to use it. But if you're an agent that knows how to be predictive and helpful for you as tying into, you know, all the other aspects of your life, all of a sudden that assistant can be truly breakthrough. So I think agents will mean that every single type of consumer, consumer hardware and software is going to need to be fully essentially rewritten and, and redefined in how it functions maybe within the next five years. And I think the first true examples we're going to start seeing about AI being able to make these autonomous decisions happens in 2025. So I think, right, that's going to be kind of a chat GPT moment where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's not just AI and me going to chat GPT and saying something. Here's an example of where AI is being able to take actions. It's basically AI for the first time to a wide audience showing reasoning and being able to act autonomously. So I think that's going to be a huge fundamental thing in the next year. Yeah, because even with a chat GPT, that was a type of consumer facing application, but people still had to come to it, right? It was, you had to seek it out versus it just naturally being in your everyday life. When I think you're, you know, I know the customer service example is a, is a common one because it, yep. it's something that almost every company has to deal with. I think it was what Klarna came out last year and made some sort of statements that, hey, we figured out customer service and we're going to be able to automate things. I think it's still TBD on how exactly widespread that is. But yeah, is when you talk about, I'm sure what everyone has an experience with customer service, let's take, you know, you're calling the airline because your flight is delayed. You get the little automated thing. You try to solve it. They're not answering your question. You're eventually just like, ah, just let me like, please let me talk to an agent. Please just like a, a human agent, like just zero, 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 zero operator. And then you talk to someone and they solve your question. What you're saying is with something like Blackwell, with better models, the logic can get so good that we might actually be able to get our situation resolved without having to hit zero, 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 zero and talk to a real agent in the near oh, future. A hundred percent. And I think it's it's a hundred fold jump in capabilities. And it's it's not just bringing, it's because it's able to show reasoning where it's not just a predefined list. It, it's, it's able to be, so much more helpful laterally across all questions, but also that we can get to a point where the AI makes a decision without having to ever get a human involved. If you want to return an item, you could entirely do it. And there's, there's also beyond customer service. Like I said, there's, it could just be going to a website or interacting with a brand and being the face of that brand to, you know, meaningfully, help you if you're going to Nike and describing exactly what kind of item you want. It might be that kind of chat box that instead of you ignoring it, you choose to begin your path with that company there because it is genuinely more helpful. Yeah. And like I said, I think so many of us have had these experiences with quote chat bots. Yep. In what nine times out of 10, it stinks. Right. And you're just like, Oh my gosh, can I just, cause it is following just that predetermined path of, okay, if they say this, then this, um, so I agree. I think that's, that certainly seems like it does have the opportunity to be that moment because suddenly, you know, if it becomes very widespread, you'll have people interacting with the AI and, and kind of be like, oh, wow, this truly is, is different. So certainly one, one to watch. I think we're all rooting for never having to talk to a donation <laughs> <laughs> when your fly is delayed again. So I, I root for that one. Uh, let's, let's go to the last last trend uh, that we're looking at in 2025 on the AI space. Yeah, and we've talked a little bit about this. Again, these ideas are going to, they're going to flow. We're going to be constantly talking about across everything we cover, but these massive clusters of GPUs, you know, when you're training these frontier models that Larry Ellison was talking about costing a hundred billion dollars across the next four to five years, you're going to need to be able to network increasing number of GPUs we're talking state of the art going from like 4,000 uh, a couple of years ago to now. We have several companies breaking the 100,000 GPUs uh, working in a cluster together. Meta, Facebook recently announced it. Elon, company, Elon Musk company, XAI, announced 100K1. And as we talked about earlier, Oracle is already talking about a 131,000 cluster for the next generation of chips. So here, here's what we need to understand though. 
when you're building out these data centers, there are massive expenses involved. GPUs are a big expense, but there's the actual land. There's the power that they consume, which was it has traditionally been more than 50% of the total cost. There's, there's networking, there's newer technologies like liquid cooling to be able to, you know, keep the temperature these data centers are running at. So we're moving to a world where there is hundreds of billions of dollars in annual CapEx building out these data centers, and we need to get as many GPUs connected as possible. Now, here's the problem. I've read that some of these AI companies, the utilization rate that they have for their GPUs, it, it's as low as 33%. It's maybe up to 50%, but they're spending so much money on these data centers, so much money on these GPUs, and they're not getting a utilization that you need to get the return on investment. The reason predominantly for this is there's a lot, but it's connectivity bottlenecks of how you're getting all these GPUs working together. So ultimately, if they're spending all that money, it's going to be worth spending whatever it takes to get state-of-the-art networking, state-of-the-art connectivity to be able to get a higher return on your investment. So David, we talked about coherent earlier and yep. I talked about you know that I'm going to be looking for a lot of other companies in the space. This is why because these massive clusters are coming on, the numbers are getting big. We might be talking about a cluster of a million GPUs and there's a bottleneck. We have to improve networking technology and I think everyone in this space is about to see significant, significant gains starting, especially in the latter half of 2025. And that's where I'm looking. It's it's hard, right? Because we're not gonna we're not gonna say that we're experts in things we're not, right? Like going and finding the networking place for this, this is happening right at this moment. This is developing. So I'm spending as much time as possible, but this is extremely complex. And it's so much work. I'm, you know, reading through transcripts from all these old companies. I'm, I'm reading through, you know, I'm, I was looking at meeting up with, uh, you know, an industry trade publication in the next couple of weeks in Northern Virginia, because I want to be able to get their take on things. You know, this is an area that previously only a few people cared about. And pretty soon a lot of people are going to care about, which is kind of what GPUs were in years ago. So I think this trend is going to be where a lot of the investment returns come from. And again, you're not going to turn on CNBC and they're going to say, today in interconnects, right? You, you need to go to something like this show for something that's specialized. And it's, it's where we are spending a ton of our research time. Um, but I wanted to kind of get out that idea behind these massive GPU clusters. We need to increase the utilization. This is the bottleneck right now. Um, as much as GPUs, this is the bottleneck and solving it's going to make some of these companies very rich. And when you talk about the companies and doing all this work, trying to unearth them and, and find them, is it a fair assessment to say that a lot of these are existing companies like a coherent who maybe had other segments and now suddenly it's, they're needing to kind of pivot their focus as a company and kind of pour more resources, more attention into solving this problem. Is it more of those established existing companies? Are we seeing funding in the startup space for this type of thing? Or is it just so kind of capital intensive that it's like this demand is going to flow to existing companies who can pivot towards this versus two guys in their garage solving this and getting funded. And suddenly the, you know, it's a $10 billion company next in the next six months. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a great question. And let's look at GPUs as a prior example of that because Nvidia was there when it transformed it took a while to see the next wave of funding of companies who said, actually, we can do this better. You're mm -hmm. seeing that now. You're seeing a lot of competition beginning to open up in the startup space. But the shift happened so rapidly and there was such a need to allocate money to there. It went to the incumbents first. I believe that's what will happen with a lot of these technologies because there's going to be a lot of money, which is going to introduce new entrants. But there is such an acute need to spend money to fix this bottleneck that I think the incumbents are going to see truly, if you get the right position companies, fantastic returns across the next year. Yeah. And you talked last week about 
companies who want to be on the leading edge stay ahead of this. There is almost this fear of if we don't do it now, if we wait, you know, for this smaller company to get their resources and set it up, we might have missed the the opportunity to do it. So it feels like that company FOMO, that CFO level, C CEO level decision of we have to do this now, we can't afford to wait, seems to also be benefiting those incumbents. Yeah. And, you know, other companies, they've seen these cycles. So we're now, we've gone through so many cycles of mega trends. Like NVIDIA, they've increased how quickly they're doing cards to a level that would have been previously unthinkable, but they realize how much money there is to be made and they realize it's existential to them as well to not be running ahead. And now AMD is going to basically stop making as advanced cards for the video game market, which is their historical bread and butter because they're trying to keep up with NVIDIA. So it works both ways that startups realize how much money there is to be made, but also incumbents are far more nimble than they might have been 20 years ago because they realize that if they're not staying nimble, they're going to lose the opportunity. Okay, so let's let's actually pivot to a listener question. Speaking of, of incumbents that have pivoted, again, we do take questions. It's uh, questions at 24wallstreet.com. Please send them in, uh, whether questions about individual stocks, news stories you're hearing, things that we're doing terribly that you wish we did better. So please send your questions in. Uh, here's the question we got. It said, in your podcast, you mentioned that Broadcom was NVIDIA's main competitor. I would like to hear more about what makes Broadcom the top competitor over AMD and Intel. There's Intel again. Don't, don't, uh, don't be too mean to them. Uh, and others, uh, you seem to indicate they produce more specialized chips. So maybe that sets them apart. So maybe just, uh, I know we're already kind of going long. So maybe just briefly touch on this listener's question on, on why Broadcom, why not talk about AMD and Intel as the main competitors? Yeah. And this, this question came from Kevin. Kevin, thank you. We appreciate it. We're going to split questions up. He actually had four. They were all very good questions. We'll take them, but anyone out there, you know, if you've got questions about the portfolio, anything, we want to make this a really listener centric show. So send us an email to that address questions at 24 seven wall street. We'll either get to them here or we'll publish an article and send you an email and let you know that we've addressed it. Like I said, we are trying to be as responsive as possible. So the question of why Broadcom over other options, well, let's just break down from the top and what's the high level thing that we need to understand about kind of the GPU and what other people would call the AI accelerator market. We've got NVIDIA, they're at roughly 85% market share. So that's that's who's taking you know the most of it. They're going to be seeing in this market something like over $150 billion in revenue in 2025. Behind them, Broadcom, they're looking at $12 billion in this fiscal year. In AI sales, AMD's looking at five billion. Marvell's probably down around a billion. And just because I have to do this because you goaded me into it, Intel is dead last at 0.5 billion. I'm shocked. That is that is for you, David. Um, so you know, Broadcom, they they're they're partially there because they already have enough momentum of their 12 billion. About two-thirds of that is for their custom accelerators, the rest is for networking. So let's look at what I've talked about networking in this show, but Broadcom is very strong in Ethernet, which is probably the main competition to uh, NVIDIA's networking solutions. Um, their Ethernet business grew at fourfold year over year last quarter, which is actually higher than their AI accelerators. The chips that are going into it, their optics grew at three times. So these are all huge numbers. Now, the problem, David, in the last episode, you asked, why aren't any of these companies able to grow as fast as NVIDIA? Well, you know, you see with Broadcom, they are kind of growing at the same level. The problem is they have enough legacy business, which is kind of reducing it. Um, you know, it, a lot of the spend that is going into kind of pre-AI data centers is now falling back. So for Broadcom, their non-AI networking revenue it was up 17% quarter over quarter, which is very good, but down 41% year over year. Wow. It shows NVIDIA, they're able to just move all upside because they're not being held back by legacy business that's reduced. And a lot of other companies are. So Broadcom is the company that best combines a clear position to growth in accelerators and a clear position to growth in networking. 
And right now the drive is to be able to offer both of those services, which AMD is trying to catch up in. They just bought, what was the name of it? I'm going to check ZT systems for 5 billion. So they're trying to catch up, but they are behind in that aspect of this market. So I just see Broadcom number one, they're a clear number two. They have a path towards $30 billion in AI revenue, um, which again, you know, NVIDIA is looking at 150 billion. Everyone's playing catch up, but they're a clear number two. I think that their chips provide the most viable alternative. I think their Windows approach provides the most viable alternative to what NVIDIA is trying to do in kind of an Apple approach of selling the complete systems. And number three, I just see AMD as uh, a, li a little bit more in a catch-up mode trying to complete this full value proposition. I think there's a chance we add AMD to our portfolio as well. I think they have a good opportunity, especially in uh, inferencing or actually running models to gain a lot of share. So we're going to keep watching that. I'm, I'm not discounting the idea that we have AMD as a portfolio component. I'm not discounting the fact that AMD may well outperform NVIDIA in, in some of the stages that we see in the future. But I do think the next purchase that we'll see, and we'll just have to look at sizing, uh, Broadcom is going to be in the portfolio. It's just a question of when we add it and at what sizing. All right, great. You mentioned the portfolio. Again, follow Eric on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow the 24-7 Wall Street handle on Twitter. That's where we're going to be sharing uh, the buys when they come out. You'll be able to link to the existing portfolios, see performance. Again, we're really excited to bring that to the listeners. Um, I think that's all for today. Eric, anything else? No, I, I think we've 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 covered a lot here. And I think it would be just, again, if if you want to follow those portfolios, make sure to go in and take the action. And finally, I know we said it last week, but just please, we're, we're getting started. We're a small podcast. We will do this as long as there's, there's listener interest. But if you have other people that are enjoying, uh, you know, cutting edge investing, uh, they enjoy stock ideas, please, you know, share this because we do see these very large trends that we described today. I think there's going to be ways to, uh, you know, profit from the company's at the forefront of it that are, you know, have the most growth behind them. But these aren't obvious things. If if you know someone who sits all day and watches CNBC, I can guarantee you a lot of these, you know, networking and interconnect opportunities, they're not going to be the lead story. You're only going to get it with a plan of how to actually invest in it on a show like this. So just please, uh, if you know anyone, share. Uh, we would love it because, again, this is a new show and we'll do this as long as, you know, we have great interest. So, uh, yeah, just please, we, we would appreciate that. Yes, please, <laughs> please, please leave us a rating like every other podcast. You know, Eric and I, we only have one mother to go in and leave some five star reviews. So we need, some, we need more reviews out there. Please tell us what you think of the show. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, for Eric Leaker, I'm David Hansen. We'll see you all next time. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about. This is not investment advice, so don't buy or sell based solely on what you hear.